Good evening. I am Stephen Berry, the Andrew W. Mellon Chief Librarian of the Frick Art Reference Library, and I'd like to welcome you all to this special 10th anniversary celebration of the Centre for the History of Collecting. In fact, the Centre is now old enough to come into the Frick. Our library is home to the centre, and it has been a pleasure to observe how harmoniously the centre's programming has complemented and even expanded the library's existing resources and staff activities. The centre's research fellows, some here tonight, 56 to date, have made ample use of our archives, auction catalogues, and photo archive materials, as they have carried out research on a myriad of topics relating to the history of collecting and the art market. Their relationship with the staff beyond the centre is symbiotic and we all, have learned, we all have learned a great deal from them as they bring little studied collectors to light and on occasion tackle topics that reach beyond the traditional range of our collections. The research tools the centre has created, such as the online archives directory, have enhanced the many online resources we have uh, created here at the Frick Art Reference Library. And the centre has published um, books about its symposia, six to date and three more in, in the works. Similarly, the centre's oral history programme, a collaboration with the Archives of American Art, is building a library of primary documentation about collectors that will, will be invaluable in the future. This evening, we will hear a lecture by the centre's director, Inga Rice, who usually introduces other speakers, so we have a bit of a turnabout here. After her lecture, we invite you to join us for a reception in the Garden Court, and I hope you will take a copy of the Centre's 10th anniversary publication as you leave. This is a book we have prepared for those who have supported and continue to support the Centre over the years. Numerous individuals and foundations to whom we, have ex we are extremely grateful but tonight it is a special gift to each of you here. So now, without further ado, let's welcome Inga, who will speak about Acts to Follow, Three Centuries of Tastemakers and Collectors. Thank you so much, Stephen, and let me add that it is an incredible pleasure to work with Stephen Barry and all of the staff of the library. The center is extremely lucky to, uh, to be in such a nurturing and supportive environment. I, I realize that now that the center is 10 and it can come to the Frick, it still has to be accompanied by an adult. <laughs> but, but, um, but also thanks to all of you for being here this evening to help us celebrate the uh, 10 years of the Center for the History of Collecting's programming, and even more to join us in uh, expressing our gratitude to all who have supported the Center during its first decade. I can't really believe it's been 10 years, and I know that my colleagues, the two assistant directors of the Center, Samantha Deutsch and Esme Quadbach, uh, join me. Uh, they've been with me the whole 10 years, too. And uh, they join me, uh, too, in saying how gratified we are that the Center has been able to do its part to help shape a new field of study and encourage new scholarship with a special focus on cultural history. If there's one thing we've learned during these past 10 years, it is that the history of collecting is really all about people. And that's, in many ways, what makes it endlessly fascinating. It's not exactly reality TV for scholars, but it certainly uh, is a way we can learn how the past informs the present. Uh, so this evening, and then in the fall, we will celebrate the history of collecting by pushing a little bit beyond uh, the general appreciation of individual collectors to ask who are the tastemakers who cause collectors to make the choices they do. I will review tastemakers over a broad swath of time, and then this fall, we will bring to the stage people engaged in the art world of today uh, to speak about tastemakers of our own time. So we can look forward to that. We have not set a date yet. <laughs> now, why is this not moving? There we go. 
So we, I think we all know what an art collector is. They've been uh, mocked and revered uh, over time. Uh, and viewed as a group, they differ considerably one from another in the motivations and methods uh, that they call on to amass collections of interest. But what is a tastemaker? I think we use the word quite freely, but what does it really mean? Is it someone who knows uh, what people want before they know it themselves, as for example, Steve Jobs might have been, all those things we didn't know we wanted. <laughs> this is not working very well. There we go, here he comes, rolling them out. Um, or is it a person who leads by example, making fashion statements others might want to emulate? Or is it someone who conveys to others that he or she is simply smarter than anyone else and therefore ought to be listened to? I believe it is, or at least it can be, someone with all of these qualities and more, including a shrewd understanding of the temper of his or her times, which may result in propagandistic collecting in one era, think Napoleon as an example, par excellence of that, or civic-minded collecting in another period, think of the founding of the National Galleries in London and in Washington, D.C. And lastly, tastemakers are often sharply aware of more material issues, recognizing opportunities where supply is available and demand can be cultivated, or an investment advantage is at hand. So this evening, I'm going to explore with you a few case studies of tastemakers from the 17th to the 20th century. Some of them were collectors themselves, while others were dealers, scholars, and even artists. Some presented themselves as prescient, some led by example. Some made it their business to be aware of the supply of art ripe for the picking. And yet others tapped into civic-minded impulses of collectors that they knew. All of them have a mixture of these qualities, but common to all is that they impress their contemporaries with their intellectual prowess, as exemplified no better than by Louisine Havemeyer's uh, remark about her friend and advisor, the tastemaker Mary Cassatt, who steered that pioneering collector into the realm of Impressionist art. Louisine wrote, quote, I felt that Miss Cassatt was the most intelligent woman I had ever met, and I cherished every word she uttered and remembered almost every remark she made. It seemed to me no one could see art more understandingly, feel it more deeply, or express themselves more clearly than she did. And on another occasion, with regard to an early purchase of a Degas, Louisine recalled, quote, I scarce knew how to appreciate the painting, or whether I liked it or not, for I believe it takes special brain cells to understand Degas. There was nothing the matter with Miss Cassatt's brain cells, however, and she left me in no doubt as to the desirability of the purchase, and I bought it upon her advice. Tastemakers also seem to have an exception, have, uh, seem to have had exceptional charisma, though with that we have to bear in mind that charisma comes in many forms, uh, eliciting admiration because of exceptional charm on the one hand, or strangely because of an air of superiority on another. We'll get to both of those kinds. Needless to say, choosing my case studies I felt there was an embarrassment of riches, and I hope after my talk we can take just a little time so that I can hear from some of you who the tastemakers you would have elected to my list uh, would have been. First on my list is the man dubbed by Horace Walpole the father of English vertu, Thomas Howard, the 21st or the second, depending on your, how you're counting, Earl of Arundel, and ultimately the first Earl of Norfolk a great and omnivorous collector uh, of marble statuary, paintings numbering over 700 at the time of his death, prints, drawings, and books, all of which were sadly dispersed, though many do still remain in England, in the Ashmolean and British Museums, in the British Library, and in the Royal Collection. For the Earl, an early appreciation of fine art developed from his inheritance of great works uh, as the nephew of the, uh, the John the I Baron Lumley, who died childless, leaving his nephew a good portion of his art collection, including precious portraits by Hans Holbein the Younger. The Earl was thus in a position to lead by example automatically upon that inheritance, but he had other t important tastemaker traits as well. He and his wife, Alethea Talbot, were passionate travelers to the continent, especially the Low Countries and Italy. 
Alethea, for her part, had brought to their marriage her own collecting passions, perhaps in her DNA from her grandmother, uh, Bess of Hardwick, um, as well as a great deal of money, always helps, from her father, the seventh Earl of Shrewsbury's fortune. Whether journeying on their own behalf or as ambassador extraordinary for Charles I, they cultivated their taste for Italian art, particularly Venetian pictures of the High Renaissance and the art of ancient Rome. You see the statues in the background of the house there from ancient Rome. Uh, now, uh, they also developed a network of agents who procured uh, both for themselves and for other avid collectors and advisors within the so-called Whitehall group. Uh, these would be George Villiers, Philip Herbert, Inigo Jones, Charles I himself, of course. And through these networks and the company they kept on their trips, we learn that like most tastemakers, the Earl and the Countess did not achieve their success as cultural leaders in isolation. Their greatest coup uh, was actually initiated by the Countess. Oh, went too far. Sorry. There we go. When she was visiting the Duke of Mantua, Ferdinando Gonzaga, in 1623, and she took note that some of the Duke's exceptional collection, which Rubens himself had curated between 1600 and 1608, might soon be available for sale because of the Duke's precarious financial situation. And right she was, because five years later, the entire assemblage of masterpieces left the Ducal Palace to be sold to King Charles I through the agency of Daniel Nice on the left and the Fl uh, Fleming operating as a dealer in Venice, whom Nicolas Lognier connected to the king, and he is portrayed in a beautiful Van Dyck portrait on the right. Often referred to as, quote, the sale of the century, this en bloc acquisition elevated Charles's collection in a single stroke to the pinnacle of all royal collections except possibly Spain's, bringing to England's shores pictures by Raphael, Titian, Correggio, Caravaggio, and Mantegna's magisterial triumphs of Caesar. Of course, none of this ended very well. Charles lost his head, and the Commonwealth sold off most of his capital collection, as it was called, keeping only some of the gems for the nation. The Earl died deeply in debt, not the least because of his collecting appetite, and even Daniel Nice failed to collect the debt owed him uh, and obtain, to obtain full payment of Charles's purchase before his demise, the king's demise. Still, Thomas and Alethea Howard could justly claim to have changed the course of British art collecting, bringing to the island nation works from the continent that would remain in Britain to this day. Leonardo drawings uh, the, in the Codex Arundel at the British Library, a wealth of Venetian pictures now in the National Gallery, as well, um, as, well as the Arundel marbles that form much of the Ashmolean Museum's collection in Oxford, and the spectacular Holbeins that the Earl had inherited from his uncle. Now, crossing the channel now, and fast forward more than a century, we will look at the character of another tastemaker working on the brink of another civil war, and rather remarkably maintaining his preeminent tastemaking role before, during, and after the French Revolution. We come to Jean-Baptiste Pierre Lebrun. Like the Earl of Arundel, Lebrun had art in his DNA as, his, as the great nephew of Louis XIV's court painter, Charles Lebrun, and as the son of an art dealer whose business he inherited in 1771. Also like Arundel, Lebrun was a connoisseur who operated on an international level, traveling often to the Low Countries and even farther afield to cultivate clients and useful contacts who included the expatriate Frenchman in England, Noël Desenfants, and the American artist and art broker, uh, John Trumbull, who was a good friend of Thomas Jefferson's when Jefferson was in Paris. But unlike Arundel, Lebrun's tastemaking skills were honed on the job and not so, from such a lofty perch as the Whitehall group. What the two men do have in common is that they both came to be respected as tastemakers because of their exceptional knowledge of both past and present art, even as Lebrun applied this knowledge in a practical and more calculating way than Arundel. The art trade was undeniably the principal focus of Lebrun's energies, but his success rested on his image as a scholar and expert whose advice on the art itself and the investment it represented could be trusted. Uh, 
The depth of his knowledge was most evident in his publications, his auction catalogues, and most notably of all, his groundbreaking Galerie des peintres flamands, hollandaises et allemands that he published in 1792. This monumental two-volume effort avoided the more common Vasarian approach that's chronological and instead presented the lives of the artists in groups that underscored artistic affinities. At the same time, Lebrun promoted himself as a discoverer of talented but undervalued masters, urging collectors not to be swayed by famous names, those designer labels, uh, that might signal nothing more than a false attribution intended to pump up the price. Significantly, the great scholar of collecting and patronage, Francis Haskell, lauded Lebrun as, quote, the first connoisseur to break with the prevailing habit of trying to attribute as many pictures as possible to the great and established names, and to insist instead on the value of rarity and unfamiliarity. For example, in his Galerie, he invariably indicated the master who influenced a given artist, and he gave shape to individual members of Rembrandt's vast school of followers, um, as very few of his contemporaries did. He even anticipated, come on, there, the 19th century rediscovery, so-called, of Johannes Vermeer by Théophile Torre, writing as none had before him, and this is Lebrun, this Vandermeer, about whom the historians never speak, merits particular attention. He is un très grand peintre, in the manner of Metsu. So it was better to be in the manner of Metsu in those days, you understand. His pictures are rare, and one pays as dearly for them as for Metsu. It seems that Vandermeer is particularly known for his effects of sunlight, and he succeeds in creating a certain illusion that way. Very prescient. But even this discovery of Vermeer suggests all, um, all of Lebrun's scholarly trappings only thinly veil a strong business side. He was unabashed about market values for works of art and was obviously in a strong position to know as one of the leading art dealers and art restorers of his day and also as the impresario of numerous auctions in aristo of aristocratic collections that were being dispersed before and just after the fall of the Bastille. His auction catalogs make mention of previous valuations for a work, an indicator, we think, of that he could support a stable investment in a time of economic mayhem. And even his most scholarly publication, The Galerie, includes references to the commercial value of an artist's work alongside the biographical details and stylistic evaluations uh, that he presented. So uh, you can see up top here in this little excerpt, he says what a picture by Dow sold for uh, some years ago to the Duc de Choiseul, and then what it uh, sold for some years later. So how did Lebrun navigate the troubled waters of 18th century French politics and their shifting allegiances? The simple answer would be opportunistically. He divorced his wife, the avowed royalist artist Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, and with his aristocratic clientele either dead or in flight, he has expanded his activities to suit the nationalistic temper of the times, involving himself with the establishment of the Musée National that would later become the Musée Napoléon. In this role, it's quite marvelous to read the turnabout of his attitude as he opens his publication, The Réflexion sur le Muséum National, penned in 1793, with this comment, quote, now that we have slain the hydra of despotism, we have achieved for our country liberty, and we don't have to pretend to embrace a phantom. It is a question, citizens, uh, citoyen, you know, allons-y, um, of forming a museum that will be composed of all the rare and precious objects belonging to the former king and emigres. The museum should honor our republic and be enriching. Paris would become the center of the universe and the place where all the gold of Europe would be reunited. But you must know, fellow citizens, that to arrive at these precious results, it is necessary to have capable men, he doesn't come right out and say like me, but anyway, dedicated to the formation of the museum. Emphatically, he says, only connoisseurs have the enlightened view necessary for the formation of, muse of a museum, and artists uh, uh, neither can nor should be part of that. 
feathering his nest maybe. Um, this is where once again the reputation for being smarter than others was key to Lebrun's success as a tastemaker as he selected and cataloged works of art that had been expropriated in one way or another from the very collectors who were once his clients and the rungs on the ladder to his own fame. More significantly, as a painter, and, but promoting himself as a restorer himself and a connoisseur with an unassailable reputation, he advised on the repair of works in the museum's collection and even on the mode of display. Lebrun's role at the Musée National was taken up and expanded by its first director, appointed by Napoleon in 1802, Dominique Vivant Baron de Nantes. Who, fill, who filled what is now the Louvre with extraordinary treasures, many of them looted from Italy, uh, Germany, and the Low Countries during the Napoleonic Wars, and many of which actually still remain in the Louvre today, masterpieces by Cimabue, Giotto, and Frangelico, as well as the marvelous Borghese collection of more than 600 ancient statues purchased, probably through a little arm twisting, from Napoleon's brother-in-law, Camillo Borghese. That loot, in fact, did much to shift the, uh, t the focus and the taste of French collectors and art conoscenti away from their preferences for northern art, the art that Lebrun had championed, to a deeper appreciation for Italian art of centuries earlier. A similar shift uh, from a preference for Dutch and Flemish cabinet pictures to a passion for Italian Renaissance and Baroque occurred in England at around the same time, signaled most obviously by the Orléans sale and the taste-making skills of Michael Bryan, who has rightly been tagged as the picture dealer extraordinaire. Brian, like Lebrun, was above all involved with art as a businessman. But even without Lebrun's artistic lineage, Brian's family were in the textile industry, he was able early on to present himself as an exceptionally astute connoisseur who could cultivate new fashions in art collecting and, like Lebrun, present himself as a scholar. As, Brian's, as the Brian expert Julia Armstrong Totten has noted, quote, he not only personally contributed towards establishing London as the center of the international art market, but he sometimes provided the catalyst that changed the prevailing taste in pictures. Perhaps he even set a trend for subsequent dealers to be recognized as a published scholar rather than just an entrepreneur. At least initially, before facing bankruptcy later in life, you'll notice this bankruptcy theme seems to happen quite a bit with these tastemakers, uh, Brian was a shrewd businessman with an impeccable sense of timing. He put together the remarkable transactions that related to the exhibition and sale of the famed Orléans collection, working with a syndicate of the Duke of Bridgewater, Earl of Carlisle, and George Leveson Gore, all related to one another. Uh, and, uh, and he arranged, he, Brian, arranged uh, for the syndicate to purchase the collection, which was almost 300 paintings, essentially as an investment, reserve a third, 99, for themselves, and then exhibit all of the pictures, including their 99, charging an admission, and eventually selling that other two-thirds through Brian's agency to realize a tidy profit for everyone. They essentially got their 99 pictures gratis, and everybody made money on the deal. In fact, it was these exhibitions that the critic Joseph Farrington, like others, declared, led the scales to fall from his eyes as he beheld the masterpieces that once graced the room of the Palais Royal. Sorry, I've not been keeping up here. These, this is his catalog, and these are these beautiful pictures that came out of the Orléans collection, almost all in the National Gallery of London, one in uh, Scotland. Like the Earl of Arundel and Lebrun, Brian worked with a whole network of agents and sponsors to ferret out desirable works whose provenance he could promote. As a signal of the approbation Brian received from contemporaries, we can read Aeneas Mackenzie's comments six full years after Brian's death. Quote, very few, if any, ever possessed so much influence in all matters of refined connoisseurship as Michael Bryan exercised. His judgment of pictures was of the first order, his information extensive, and his enthusiasm for the sublime and beautiful in works of art of boundless fervor. His opinion was consequently looked up to as, a de as decisive of the merit or demerit of paintings, unquote. 
The sharp intellect, scholarly distinction, and awareness of the temper of the times, that capacity to know what people want before they know it themselves, that characterized the taste-making of Thomas Howard, Lebrun, Vivant Denon, Michael Bryan, gives way to something rather different in the eccentric, erratic critic John Ruskin. Come on. I feel a little odd talking about John Ruskin up here because Stephen Barry is a world-renowned scholar on John Ruskin, so please forgive me, Stephen. Um, this is the best I can do. Believe me, none of the tastemakers I put on my list has confused me more than this Victorian titan of critical thinking and critical writing because of the inconsistencies of his views and the deeply personal motivations that underlie his decisions to elevate or denigrate an individual artist or style. Case in point, Ruskin's almost worshipful praise of Turner that began at age 17, Ruskin being 17, when he wrote a rebuttal to criticism of this painting, Juliet and Her Nurse, published in Blackwood's magazine. According to Ruskin, quote, Turner is the exception to all rules and can be judged by no other standard of art, unquote. And throughout his life, indeed, he promoted Turner's career while his slander of Whistler all but led to the artist's ruination, although I have to say Whistler was pretty good at doing that all by himself. Um, Ruskin constantly commented on the importance of faithful representation to nature, and yet to our modern eyes, these paintings by Turner and Whistler <laughs> uh, show that the magic for us in both artists' works lies in their interpretive powers. For Turner, as his rival John Constable had observed, quote, he seems to paint with tinted steam, so effervescent and so airy. While Whistler himself, in his gentle art of making enemies, you see what I mean, um, expressed his own theory of art by saying, nature contains the elements in color and form of all pictures, as the keyboard contains the notes of all music. But the artist is born to pick and choose and group with science these elements that they may result in, in beauty as the musician gathers his notes and forms his chords until he brings forth from chaos glory harmony. So despite the similarities we may see, Ruskin saw these two artists very, very differently, upholding Turner as the creator of faithful and brilliant representations grounded in nature, albeit with a heavy dose of human expressive power, while he decried Whistler for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. And uh, this was the, uh, the, the flung paint, uh, the falling rocket uh, in question. It was that particular painting that Ruskin laid into. But I think that Turner's fireworks over Santa Maria della Salute uh, is not all that different. <laughs> anyway, on the one hand, Ruskin, with typical self-contradiction, wrote in Modern Painters advice for young artists that they, quote, should go to nature in all singleness of heart and walk with her laboriously and trustingly, rejecting nothing, selecting nothing, and scorning nothing, and rejoicing always in the truth. But on the other hand, he concluded that memory and imagination should lead and serve as the artist's master. How do you square that? Contradiction notwithstanding, people flocked to his lectures as Slade professor at Oxford, and they read his writings voraciously as guides to aesthetic understanding. Ruskin's concern over fidelity to nature and moral purpose of art also underlies his detestation of virtually all art created after the early Renaissance, which in turn justifies to some degree his high praise for the art of oops, the art of the pre-Raphaelite pre Brotherhood, even in the face of negative reactions to their art in the popular press among art connoisseurs. This was most obvious in Ruskin's lengthy letter to the Times defending John Everett Millay's Christ in the House of His Parents, a painting whose central character had been described by Charles Dickens as, quote, a hideous, wry-necked, blubbering, red-haired boy in a nightgown who appears to have received a poke playing in an adjacent gutter, unquote. Well, <laughs> Although Ruskin has always seemed to me to be the quintessential, if eccentric, Victorian Englishman, the impact of his critical thinking had a mighty reach, especially as it nurtured art historical biases in the nascent discipline of art history in America. 
Ruskin maintained a faithful correspondence with Charles Eliot Norton, Harvard's intellectual guru, whose influence on other tastemakers and collectors of the Gilded Age could never be underestimated. And in fact, through Ruskin's influence on Norton, uh, his legacy as a champion of Gothic architecture, Italian early Renaissance painting, as well as the moral uprightness of beauty itself, lasted for decades, as did his unflinching criticism of late Renaissance and Baroque art for its extravagance and what he saw as insincerity. So now that I've brought us to, oh, I didn't give you Charles Eliot Norton, there he is, and these are letters that Ruskin and Norton exchanged. Um, so now that I've brought us to America, we'll stay here, first exploring the tastemakers of the Gilded Age with Samuel Putnam Avery and after him Bernard Berenson, a student of Charles Eliot Norton. The two men, Berenson and Avery, uh, shared few character traits other than possessing remarkable, though very different forms of charisma. Avery, though not born to wealth, impressed one and all as a patrician among art dealers whose fairness, intelligence, and charm combined with his civic-minded sense of duty to elevate his fellow citizens' appreciation of art. And this made him a leading cultural figure and tastemaker of his day. Berenson, by contrast, captivated people through his extraordinary confidence in his own opinions, <laughs> methodically, if not always kindly or generously, uh, building a reputation as the single most important authority on Italian art, whose imprimatur was essential for any collection of consequence. Now, in Avery's case, having begun his career making prints after works by the Hudson River School artists Thomas Cole, Asher Durand, and Frederick Church to sell to publishers, he only entered the world of art dealing in 1864 at the age of 42 when he set up a gallery with financial support from the Baltimore collector but New York resident Henry Walters. Uh, he, um, and because of those bonds with the artists that Avery had formed during his career in printmaking, just months after he opened his gallery, no fewer than 48 artists signed a document attesting to his honor, and those same artists then, three years later, lobbied hard for his election uh, in the, for the 1867 uh, Committee of Works of Art for the Paris Universal uh, Exposition, and indeed he did win that uh, honor as art commissioner. Exposure to the French capital had an enormous influence on Avery, as he then went on, went on to advise collectors such as William Henry Vanderbilt on their purchases of mostly contemporary French and European art, taking them on studio visits during his annual trips to Paris. But above all, Avery's ability to juggle his role as a cultural leader and art dealer with no evident conflict of interest cemented his position as one of New York's most admired tastemakers of the day. The New York Evening Post put it this way, quote, his long and honorable career seems to us peculiarly exemplary because of the dignity with which he filled public positions and more especially because of the ease with which he turned from his business to public service. Avery was very much a club man in an era when meetings at social clubs dedicated to common interests in the arts and letters resulted in such momentous events as the founding of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1870, after a gathering of artists, writers, and political and civic leaders, who I picture here, met at the Union League Club. Avery was part of that founding core, and he served on the board of trustees of the Met for more than 30 years, functioning frequently as the institution's unofficial art advisor for acquisitions, and prompting gifts by Cornelius Vanderbilt of celebrated pictures such as Rosa Bonheur's Horse Fair, a picture actually sold, er, uh, Avery had earlier sold to Cornelius Vanderbilt out of the collection of A.T. Stewart, and bequests of whole collections assembled by the Met's uh, first uh, female uh, trustee, Catherine Lorillard Wolfe, in 1887, and w William Henry Vanderbilt in 1902. Certainly Avery's natural charisma and openness was a key factor in making him a leader, leading culture broker of his day. Bernard Berenson, on the other hand, could never have been said to be a clubman. 
or courtly in his demeanor, as his rhetorically electrifying wife, Mary, would relish in their intellectual superiority as they denigrated the collections of Gilded Age magnates such as Peter Widener and Henry Walters. And yet, Berenson became the go-to guy all the same, perhaps because his harsh criticisms often resulted in elevating the quality of these collections overall. Isabella Stewart Gardner's mostly epistolary friendship with Berenson betrays an almost girlish crush on the acknowledged leading connoisseur of Italian art, who would ultimately recommend that she purchase some 50 paintings. Cynthia Saltzman has culled some wonderful examples of the younger man's flattery. Uh, here's one. Well, I come again trying to despoil you. This time it's a Tintoretto I wish you to buy. And then Isabella's gushing responses. The delightful letter made me quite frantic to fly to Fiesole, Berenson's home outside Florence, and drink in the air and perhaps saunter with you in the sunny afternoons. And about her Titian that she was so, that Berenson arranged the purchase for, I am breathless about Europa. I am back here tonight after two days orgy. The orgy was drinking myself drunk with Europa. Every inch of paint in the picture seems full of joy. So for those of you unfamiliar with how Berenson's star as a tastemaker rose here in a very short capsule form, uh, it is. Born to Lithuanian Jewish parents, he was educated at the prestigious Boston Latin School and then Harvard. And at Harvard, he befriended numerous current and future social and intellectual leaders of Boston society and came under the spell of Ruskin's pen pal, Charles Eliot Norton. Norton's art history courses and post-graduation studies set up in Italy that were sponsored in Berenson's case by several of Boston's Brahmins uh, permanently turned the young man's interest to art and most passionately to the early Italian Renaissance. Early on, B.B., as he was known, recognized that earning a reputation as a preeminent scholarly authority on art would be his path to success. His nearly 20 books would not, however, make him a wealthy man, or even the most sought-after tastemaker of the day. For that, he needed to burnish his reputation as a connoisseur, with an unerring eye for quality and authenticity, to develop business relationships with the leading dealers of the day, Kalnagi and Otto Gutekunst, who worked with Kalnagi, and later Joseph Duveen. Ultimately, his eye, uh, along with the lectures his wife and promoter-in-chief, Mary, delivered all across America at clubs and universities, enabled Berenson to realize his goal and become a very wealthy and influential tastemaker in the process. He made sure that egos were stroked when it would benefit him, for example, giving Mrs. Gardner a copy of Julia Cartwright's biography of Isabella d'Este to encourage the Gilded Age Isabella to identify with her Renaissance namesake as a great patron and collector. But he could also verge on the insulting, as he did in a during a 1904 visit to evaluate the collection of uh, Philadelphian Peter Widener. Mary recalled that Widener was almost pleading in his hope that the Berensons would legitimize his pictures, and she recorded that sadly, quote, they have really nothing of importance among their Italians, and we could not leave one single great name. He, was very, he Widener, was very much pleased whenever we could, would allow a picture to stay in the gallery, even if shorn of its great name, but we had to banish several. Now, in fairness, this humiliation seems to have prompted Widener to uh, improve his, uh, uh, upgrade his taste quite considerably as he bought these stunning paintings by Van Dyck, Rembrandt, and Raphael, just to show you a few. In the case of Henry Walters, whose art scout Berenson promised he would be for a 10% premium, B.B. behaved even more hypocritically, or maybe just opportunistically. He, re he rarely steered the Baltimore collector to the finest pictures on the market, and starting in 1912, he favored his lucrative um, and exclusive and clandestine relationship with the flamboyantly successful dealer Joseph Duveen never informing Walters of this, of course. Most glaringly, when Berenson offered to sell Walters pictures from his personal collection, he wrote of a Bernardo Dotti that was so admirable a thing. And then in later years, he commented snidely to, to someone else that all of the paintings he sold to Walters were inferior objects. Worse yet, 
it gets worse. When, B when BB finally arrived to evaluate Walter's collection, something that he had been asked to do years earlier, the verdict was that 85% was misattributed and dozens had to be purged. Oh well. So with regard to Duveen, who uh, Berenson's relationship was clear, or at least it is now, as he entered into the arrangement when Duveen was at his height and the frenzy of art collecting among American tycoons, Frick, Altman, Huntington, had reached its zenith. By 1912, Berenson's reputation was unshakable and Duveen's inventory most desirable after purchases in 1906 and 7 of the Heinauer and Kahn collections, just to name a couple of the most prestigious collections he'd acquired. Yet I hesitate to call Duveen a tastemaker in his own right, uh, even though he handled so many major transactions that fueled the Gilded Age appetite for old masters and 18th century British portraiture. He had charisma, no question, and he was certainly a self-promoter of the highest order, uh, but his strength was in brilliantly monitoring the supply of art and nurturing an existing demand for it that had been created less bombastically by others, true connoisseurs such as Otto Gutekunst, A.J. Sully, Roland Nodler with his partner Charles Carstairs. But there's no doubt that Duveen used his considerable charm and, co uh, and coaching on attributions he received from Berenson to sell his stock for remarkable sums. He focused intently on a handful of influential collectors, making each one feel extraordinarily special, just as our next and last tastemaker did, Leo Castelli. In introducing her, in, her recent in-depth analysis of Castelli's success, Tizia Hulst noted that, quote, when the post-war art dealer Leo Castelli died in 1999, the art world took note. In a New York Times obituary, John Russell lauded him as, quote, the New York art dealer who played an extraordinary role in shaping contemporary art. Elizabeth Baker, editor of Art in America, observed that Castelli had been, quote, pivotal to so many important developments in American art that his professional life is inextricably linked to the history of the period. While in The New Yorker, Peter Sheldahl opined that Castelli's web of influence allowed him to change the culture of art from the inside out. And even Hilton Kramer, the curmudgeon, conceded that, quote, more than any critic or collector or museum curator in the 1960s, it was Castelli who presided over the radical expansion of the contemporary art scene. So critics agreed, Leo Castelli changed the course of art history, and by creating and nurturing an aura of success, he came to be known as someone who knew what people wanted before they knew it themselves, as someone more perceptive, perhaps even smarter than everyone else, and as a man whose charm and continental élan uh, offered a model of sophistication that post more Americans wanted to emulate. Born to a life of privilege, Castelli studied law and then at 25 moved to Bucharest where he met and soon married Ileana Sonnabend. The couple moved to Paris in 1935 and started a gallery on the Place Vendôme with the decorator René Drouin, exhibiting antique furniture and works by Max Ernst, Merit Oppenheim and several of the Surrealists. The war brought them, as well as numerous émigré artists, uh, to New York in 1941. Then, following a stint in the U.S. Army, Castelli turned his interest to art and became a devotee of Alfred Barr, whose famous modernist genealogy uh, Castelli embraced wholeheartedly, ultimately contributing his own views to the next generation of the modernist evolution. Indeed the, indeed, the evolutionary view of art movements was at the root of Castelli's striving to find artists who would define the next avant-garde movement. Uh, this uh, kind of, it's not really a spoof, I think it was intended quite seriously, this um, update, if you will, of uh, Barr's genealogy was done by Daniel Ferral. Uh, so Castelli brought, uh, this, brought in the successors, if you will, to abstract expressionists, artists who would define the next avant-garde movement. And as Barbara Rose observed, what Castelli really sold was a sense of art history being made right then and there. He believed his artists to be in the same league as Matisse, Cezanne, and Picasso. He believed it, and he made the collectors believe it too. 
Castelli's savoir faire and continental air was made to order for the social world that enveloped the New York art scene of the post-war period. Um, but more than uh, just being a party animal, he respected the artists for their ideas. Uh, here you see him with Rosenquist, Jasper Johns, and Andy Warhol. Uh, and, and he respected their talents too, even gave them stipends to free them from, uh, financially from dependence on uncertain sales of untested art. He thus was equally at ease with emerging artists living in comparative poverty, here they all are, uh, mostly downtown, as he was with the uptown crowd of collectors and by then successful surrealist artists like Peggy Guggenheim, the collector, and her uh, briefly husband, Max Ernst. As Jasper Johns noted, quote, I found it wonderful that a man of his sophistication and urbanity would approach me in a non-patronizing way and think I could enter the world he was dealing with. There weren't many people involved in art, the art world in the 50s, who had that kind of international ease. That, combined with his ability to be with artists without any sense of remove, was rare and benefited everybody. Castelli's ability to live and thrive in both worlds was already in evidence in 1951 in the support and active role he played in the Ninth Street Show, which he likened to a Salon des Indépendants for the New York School of Artists. Castelli helped the co-organizer Conrad Marcarelli select 75 works and is said to have rehung the show some 20 times just to keep each artist's ego satisfied. This show, well, they were nervous. <laughs> uh, this show set him on his way, and then in the years prior to opening his own gallery in 1957, Castelli owned his talent spotting skills working with Sidney Janis. Ultimately, though, as Janis championed European artists, Castelli focused exclusively on Americans, giving strength to the pride collectors took in owning works by their own countrymen. And it worked as is attested uh, in this Life magazine commentary in 1960. Quote, by taking a risk on young, unknown Americans, Leo Castelli made gains for both himself and the artists. Here he stands by five prime investments, Arundel Castle by Frank Stella, a flag by Jasper Johns, an untitled work by Lee Bontecue, torso by Eugene Higgins, and the bed by Robert Rauschenberg. So once his gallery was open, and in fairness, much, much assisted by his lifelong partner in the art world, if not forever in marriage, Ileana Sonnabend, and later with Ivan Karp, uh, Castelli demonstrated extraordinary marketing savvy. He used photography and his own artist's prints to produce visually captivating exhibition announcements, and he freely distributed photographs um, to magazine editors and museum directors, such as Alfred Barr, probably recognizing, as Barr had done, that exposure is half the battle and in, make, in making a bid for a place in history, because Barr also was concerned that MoMA's pictures be widely uh, reproduced and distributed. In this way, Castelli was also following a strategy not unlike Lebrun's and Berenson's in publishing information about the art he was promoting, though in Castelli's case, this would be articles in Life magazine and in Playboy, uh, which was entirely in keeping with the mad men mentality of American men at the 1950s who needed persuading, perhaps, that art collecting was a path to success, both socially and in the mating game, rather than an effete pastime for precious intellectuals. Perhaps more importantly, Castelli made the collectors themselves players in, the business, in building his artists' success stories. This recognition of the power of provenance for Castelli, an awareness of how the name of a past owner will add value to a work in the future, was part of Castelli's promotional program from the start. Because in 1957, his new gallery mounted the first collector's annual exhibition for which he invited 20 recognized collectors, Joseph Hershorn, Richard Brown Baker, Roy Newberger, and others, to select a single work that they found significant or likable. He carefully positioned works of art in important collections, demonstrating what Seattle collector Bagley Wright characterized as, quote, Leo's greatest gift, his ability to make you think he was doing you a favor by selling you a painting. 
Here too, Castelli shares a strategy with tastemakers of years past, promoting value by association, whether it was Arundel and the Gonzaga collection for Charles I, Lebrun listing previous distinguished owners like the Duc de Choiseul or Rondon de Boisset, Brian promoting the sale of the Royal Orléans collection, or Berenson asserting the value of the Rodolf Kahn provenance of so many pictures Duveen was offering. So after this review of a few tastemakers, of the many, many who have created and nurtured markets, I think it's safe to conclude that impressing collectors with exceptional intelligence and doing so with a heavy dose of charisma, whether Berenson's auteur or Castelli's, uh, what Paul Sheldahl called silken manners and melting gaze, um, is the time-honored way forward for tastemakers. And I will leave it to you and hope to hear from you uh, uh, who the other tastemakers might be, but just as uh, I think we should keep this on the screen, this is a candid shot of Leo Castelli, uh, Charles Saatchi, and Larry Gagosian, either in the Hamptons or the south of France. I really don't know. Anyway, so thank you. Now, okay, so. So because it's the center's birthday, I get to ask the first question, <laughs> and, and that is, uh, who are some other tastemakers who you would have wished I had explored, or maybe I still should? In the back? I can't. Uh, Pierpont Morgan Sr. and Jr. Uh, Jr. is less well known, but he would collected quite a bit. Oh, quite a bit, I think, is the operative phrase, because especially um, uh, junior, because um, I think, well, tastemaker uh, up to a point, but I think that because Morgan bought so much en bloc, uh, he, would, he would vacuum up collections and then uh, pick and choose. And he, he also, I think, wisely sought the advice of, uh, for his manuscripts, especially of Bell de Costa Green. And, uh, and, and trusted in many uh, advisors. I, I have a little trouble, brilliant as he was as a collector and, and uh, the debt we owe him for uh, his gifts to the Metropolitan Museum and the Morgan Library and his presidency of the Met. I don't, uh, I don't personally see him as a tastemaker, but everybody has a right to an opinion. Alfred Stieglitz. Yeah, very, very fair. Um, people often mention, um, uh, it's 291, right? Um, the gallery uh, of Stieglitz and, and his role with Georgia O'Keeffe and all that they did, and Peggy Guggenheim also in her uh, activities at more or less the same time. And uh, Peggy Guggenheim has been something I've been interested to try to figure out which side of the tastemaker fence she's on. Stieglitz, I think it would be fair to say that he was. There was a wonderful exhibition in Washington that explored uh, his role there that was really superb. Cheryl. Well, I'm glad you brought her up because if you haven't gone yet to the Visionaries show at the Guggenheim, I would encourage every one of you to go to that because that's a, a fantastic um, appraisal and uh, promotion of people who I think were true tastemakers. Uh, Catherine Dreyer, of course, is one of the founding, well, Armory Show and her activities with John Quinn and then um, and, and the Societe and... Um, is it anonyme? Yeah, with Marcel Duchamp. Uh, she really made great strides. And Yale, of course, has all of Catherine Dreyer's archives. And they put on a fantastic show a few years ago of the Societe Anonyme and the role that Catherine Dreyer played at, with, with the Armory Show, the founding of MoMA, all of the activities of the 1910s, 20s. And uh, the show at the Guggenheim, if any of you have not yet been, celebrate the founding collections of the museum, Solomon R. Guggenheim, uh, ultimately Peggy Guggenheim, Tannhauser, uh, uh, Nierendorf, and Catherine Dreyer. 
Oh, critics. Well, we had John Ruskin, so <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I think Clement Greenberg might very well qualify, if I think of, of his influence. And I think there are other critics, too, who maybe would fall onto that list, but probably Clement Greenberg in our era, uh, maybe I'm just speaking for myself and getting old, <laughs> uh, would, would certainly be on that. Yes. Sherman Lee. Sherman Lee. Well, you know, museum curators and directors play a special role, and certainly for um, Americans' appreciation of Asian art, he, um, he, his efforts are seminal. There, there are others uh, besides Sherman Lee who, who supported and cultivated the taste for Asian art, but he was a, a towering figure, certainly. It's a good one. I should he, be taking notes. Didn't bring a pencil. You, you may have said this, but Edith Halpert? Edith Halpert, um, I, I, probably some of you have read Lindsay Pollock's wonderful book, the, the downtown, on the Downtown Gallery, and Edith Halpert certainly. She and I also have been thinking people like Mary Boone and, uh, and, and other um, often women gallerists in the uh, post-war era are very, very important, and I think Edith Halpert very much so, yeah. Alfred Barr, well, this, this is sort of, it's kind of like Sherman Lee and, and what the, the impact that a dynamic and, and forward-thinking museum director can have is, is extraordinary. And, uh, well, you know better than I do, Susan, the, the impact on what people came to expect modern art to be, um, very much in accordance with what Alfred Barr shaped of, of what we know of it through MoMA. So that's certainly... Absolutely right. Philip II of Spain. Why not? <laughs> Jonathan Brown wrote Kings and Connoisseurs, if you didn't know this, and knows all too well how brilliantly the kings of Spain shaped Spanish taste. And where would Velazquez have been? Um, well, that's Philip IV. That's right. It's really Ru where would Rubens have been? But how, um, Jonathan, how would he have, um, I mean, he was the king, and I, I always think, you know, it's kind of, it's nice to be king, because you, you have <laughs> the immortal words of Mel Brooks, I think. <laughs> but um, I, I think that, um, well, it, it, a lot of kings aren't tastemakers. I guess that's, the, if you flip it around, then, then it's fair to say that he really uh, rises above, above the crowd. I think he, he really furnishes a paradigm against which the collecting of the 20th century can, can play off because How interesting. There, there are some similarities, but the differences are also revealing. How interesting. Well, I'll have to get you back here to elaborate on that, I think. Just a couple more tastemakers, and then I'll ask for other questions. <laughs> Debbie. I have a couple. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, both, I think. Uh, certainly, if, for those of you who saw the show in Philadelphia on Durand-Ruel, uh, that made abundantly clear through brilliantly researched archival work um, just how um, ahead of the curve he was. And, and actually, like the tastemakers I chose, Durand-Ruel, briefly, it, he abandoned it after a while, but he published uh, a, a, a journal, too. I mean, he was promoting through publication, and this seems to be a, a, a modus operandi that has worked for many a, a tastemaker. And Andy Warhol, I, yeah, I mean, gee, I, I, it's really interesting. I mean, today you would certainly say he was a tastemaker, but it, it had to uh, sort of marinate for a while because of the, of the controversies in his own day. But... Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you could acknowledge Andy Warhol as a tastemaker. Not that many, well, yeah, and people, the collectors followed, that's for sure, even if the artist didn't. Jackie Kennedy. Jackie Kennedy as a tastemaker? Well, as I, you know, she's an example to follow in the sense of um, the, uh, the style and the um, approach to display with her revamping of the White House. I, I don't know what she collected 
is as a sort of a model, but anyway. So one more. <laughs> Douglas Cooper, yes, that's a, a wonderful one, and um, and his whole um, circle, really. I mean, this is a bit like the Whitehall group, much later, and uh, and he he certainly had an extraordinary impact too. But let, let's have other questions too, if you have some. Yes. That it wasn't enough. Oh, for Berenson, that yeah, that he wasn't going. He had to cultivate the connoisseurship, and yeah, right. Well, his books. I mean, although his books helped his reputation for connoisseurship because they established the famous Berenson lists that indicated the attributions. Um, I think that Berenson's publications would have uh, rested in a very academic environment had he not um, sort of gone forward um, and taken it to the next step. Well, maybe because the academic world and the social world in Europe, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries, coalesced more, I think. Yeah. 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 Right. That's true. That's true. It's a good point. Did we have any other questions? Because we can keep talking at our reception, our sort of a birthday party. It's a <laughs> modest birthday party, <laughs> but do join us and to celebrate. <laughs>